Welcome to our Moment of Truth with Amy Chen Mills special episode with the author of the book Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution, Rain Wilson. You would recognize Rain as Dwight Schrute from the Emmy Award winning TV show The Office. But did you know he has written three books, is the founder of the media company Soul Pancake and host of Rain Wilson and the Geography of Bliss on Peacock. Rain is co-author of the book Soul Pancake, Chew on Life's Big Questions, and author of the memoir Bassoon King, My Life in Art, Faith, and Idiocy. Welcome to Santa Cruz in advance, Rain Wilson. Hi, Amy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Soul Boom is my recent book. It came out about a year ago, and I'm celebrating the release of the paperback and doing an event there in Santa Cruz and a reading and a kind of a Q&A type of thing. Um, and we've just launched the Soul Boom podcast, kind okay. of related to the themes of the book. I'm just going to sort of start at the beginning with you and what you talk about in the book. You talk about going through a period of depression in your 20s and 30s. I'm just going to read from the book. I dealt with many mental health issues that caused me incredible pain and hardship. After graduating from college, I suffered years of debilitating anxiety attacks and to this day have an ongoing anxiety disorder that I have to monitor and work on with great seriousness and care and therapy, lots of therapy. Um, you know, I'm mentioning this because one, I think it's important for people to understand the humanity of celebrities and actors. It just, you know, that people are real human beings. Um, and also, you know, I went through a period of, of depression in my twenties as well. And that woke me up to the suffering of people. It opened my heart. And I'm wondering how did that, how did it affect you in terms of your spiritual journey to to go through this suffering and you still go through it from time to time, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Amy. Uh, well, well posited question. Um, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. So number one is we're in the midst of the greatest mental health crisis probably in human history. Uh, it's really affecting uh, kids, especially under 30, and Gen Zs. Um, and it's super important for people to talk about their own mental health struggles to kind of build a bridge and a connection with this younger generation that is suffering so much. I mean, suicides are up by 30%. Anxiety is up over 50%. Depression, uh, loneliness has been qualified as a national epidemic by the Surgeon General. And um, so I like to share my story. So young folk know that they're not alone, especially, you know, actors on TV shows that they might admire. So that's number one. And number two, like you said, my mental health struggles, my depression and anxiety and addiction issues in my 20s opened me up to the possibility of a spiritual path. So I, I found uh, spirituality in through that suffering. Uh, did it also attune me to the suffering of others? through, you know, greater compassion. Yes, absolutely. But um, it also showed me because in the 90s, there weren't many resources for people suffering from mental health stuff. There wasn't even a people didn't even talk about like mental health as a as a thing. Um, but I uh, started looking into spirituality as a as a path because of that suffering. And and that's helped me tremendously. So that's part of what the book Soul Boom is about, and partially what the what the podcast Soul Boom is about is the the personal spiritual transformations that that we can undertake uh, to help make our lives better, more rich, with deeper kind of wellness and connection um, on a spiritual path. There's other aspects to the book, but that's one of the central uh, themes. I'm going to ask you a question that's going to sound probably dumb, like a dumb question from someone who has a, a spiritual understanding, you know, uh, but I think that people often, you know, the Buddha talks about having too many desires. And one of the desires that I think is ubiquitous in our society is for influence, for fame, for, for money. And so here you are, someone who can maybe speak to what happens when you get relatively famous um, and and you have influence and you maybe have some money 
in terms of your happiness level? Is that, you know, like, I just want to sort of, I mean, maybe you're going to say, hey, my happiness level went way up. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. not going to work for me. But <laughs> in terms of this question, but I think people think about these things, you know, like, I want that. I want that. I want that. Did yeah. you find that it made your, I mean, besides maybe just doing your passion, right? Like that's good. That's happiness in a way, but did it change your happiness level to become a celebrity? Uh, no, quite the contrary. It brought with it a, a, a tremendous number of complications, you know, for an insecure, you know, nerdy kid from the Seattle suburbs uh, who undertook being an actor and partially anyone who wants to be an actor wants a certain measure of of love and attention i mean you wouldn't do it otherwise you wouldn't kind of be on a stage putting your heart on your sleeve you know trying to get laughs if you didn't you know resonate with you know wanting a certain measure of kind of uh, attention so and when they talk to young people about what they want you know fame is the number one thing that young people want because fame hits all of the the need the quote unquote needs you know it gives you status it gives you love it gives you material comfort so um and and listen you know as george clooney famously said no one wants to hear a celebrity complain about anything um i there were a, a number of things that came with fame that were wonderful, Um, incredible opportunities. You know, I just got to go to India and meet the Dalai Lama. And that door was open because of, I was on the office and because I did a TV show. It wasn't open because I'm special in any way, shape or form. So there were a lot of complications that came with fame, uh, a lot of difficulties. Um, And at the same time, I remain super grateful for the office as a TV show and for the opportunities that it provided. I was able to pay off my student loans, buy a house. Um, so a number of, of great things, but it, it, it definitely uh, poses its own set of challenges. You can watch any kind of VH1 behind the music. I don't think that exists anymore, but any story of, uh, celebrities and musicians and whatnot to just get a glimpse there. Um, Jim Carrey talks about it very, very well. Um, Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I've heard him speak several. Yeah. He's great. You are of the Baha'i faith. um, And you talk about that in your book quite a bit. You talk about going to Israel and going to one of the most holy sites of the Baha'i religion. I don't know if a lot of people know what Baha'i is, so I'm wondering if you want to just sort of explain it. I don't know how important it is to you now. It seems still very important to you to be Baha'i. Um, yes. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a Baha'i. I was raised Baha'i. I left it hardcore in my 20s. I didn't, like so many people, they don't want anything to do with religion, organized religion, ugh. Um, you know, organized religion equals what judgment, shame, morality, kind of administration, so many evils that have been perpetrated. Patriarchy, patriarchy have been <laughs> that's, perpetrated. That's my issue. <laughs> uh, have been perpetrated by, you know, organized religion. And, you know, especially us Gen Xers uh, and millennials really left religion in droves. And, you know, I did the same thing and then slowly came back to my faith, but it's an important part of my life. It gives it a lot of structure and meaning and focus and purpose. So much of Soul Boom, the the concepts of the book were inspired by the Baha'i faith and Baha'is are all about uh, using spiritual tools for personal and social transformation. And the social transformation is especially relevant to the book that I believe, Baha'is believe, that we can use spiritual qualities and practices and philosophies to transform society. It's not, spirituality is not just about finding increased serenity in your heart through a personal private practice, but it actually can 
influence the world and make it a better place. Um, I, I really want to talk about that because that, that's something you write in your book about, and I think it's important. Um, and I also want to just ask you this question because it came up. I'm sure it comes up from time to time, and I just want to give you a chance to address it, which is Baha'i is a religion. It pr- probably has patriarchal roots like all the other ones. Um, someone said to me, well, isn't that, aren't they anti-LGBTQ plus, you know, aren't they? So do you, how do you, is that even an issue for you? Do you think it's not so big of an issue at this time? How do you reconcile that or, you know? Um, yeah. So basically every religion on the planet, um, has pretty strict moral laws about sexuality and marriage, you know, even, even Buddhism, Uh, believe it or not. Western Buddhism is much more about meditation, but when you look at Mahayana Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, so there are, it's a very complicated and difficult topic for me. Um, I struggle with those teachings and I I have a very hard time with them. Basically, the Baha'i teachings are that marriage is for, sex is for marriage and marriage is between a man and a woman um and that's uh it doesn't have a whole lot to say as a religion other than that so there's a lot of gay baha'is um a lot of gay baha'is on the you know on the queer spectrum and uh it's it's a real struggle and you know the way that i look at it is if i'm in alignment with 90 plus percent of the baha'i faith and i struggle with this one particular teaching um, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with what works. I also feel like the Baha'i faith is very different than other faith traditions in the fact that we are told to fight for human rights at all costs. And even people who are LGBTQ plus who are being, uh, discriminated against Baha'is are asked to stand up for the rights of people. We do not judge anyone. Everyone gets their, the choice of their, of their life and their path. There's not a concept of like, Morality doesn't work in the Judeo-Christian way in the Baha'i faith. There's not like hell and God judging people for their bad choices, et cetera, that the concept of sin doesn't really work in the same way. These are moral guidelines to make your life better and richer. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated and difficult uh, topic. And it, we're in such a polarized world right now that it's either like, you're fully for LGBTQ plus or you're fully against, and there's no kind of conversation or gray area. So um, I will assure you that Baha'is everywhere love and serve the LGBTQ plus communities. Um, many of my son's godfather, many of my best friends are, are in that world, family members, and um, uh, I couldn't I couldn't love a community more um and i and i struggle with this with this teaching very much mm-hmm. but at that at the same time i feel like the faith has a lot to offer mm-hmm. thank you and, and i just want to mention that the book isn't necessarily about baha'i or converting people to baha'i in fact you have a lot of you have several chapters on religion in general and how we need a new religion in fact you propose a new religion <laughs> which is called yep. soul boo um but I, I want to go back to what you said about the Baha'is and, and you yourself believe that spirituality isn't just an individual enterprise. Um, and I'm going to read a passage from your book on page 10. Most people's spiritual paths end there at the personal. When most people think of spiritual tools for change, growth, and finding peace, they think of themselves working internally to increase serenity, perspective, and wisdom. In contemporary American culture, we rarely view a spiritual path as having much, if anything, to do with the peace, serenity, and wisdom of the totality of humanity. This leads me to the next part of the journey, the other branch of our twofold moral purpose, our spiritual journey, not as an individual, but as a collective, a species on a planet, a planet that we are on the verge of destroying. Now, as someone who comes from a spiritual background. I was raised also in a spiritual atmosphere of this three principle psychology that, that I teach and work with. 
but I, I, because I've been in this atmosphere, I have a, you know, and I've been working with this for a long time, there is a sense, and I'm going to say this, you could tell me if, if you disagree, but especially amongst white spiritual communities, there's an emphasis on the internal and, and people sometimes talk about spiritual bypassing, where when you have all this tremendous upheaval in the outer world with, you know, uh, Trump's election and the climate crisis and what's happening in Israel, Gaza, Palestine, people are, can be sort of like, well, that's going to interfere. If I think about that, that's going to interfere with my bliss, <laughs> you know, and I get, and I think it's important to maintain your mental health, but, you know, I'm about to interview my friend, Alvin Dawkins, who grew up in the civil rights movement as a black man who talks about with passion how spirituality in the black community especially during the civil even before the civil rights movement right even in in um in uh slavery times was so essential for their liberation you know it was a, it was attached to their political activism it was the root of their i mean i'm not saying every black person but you know you saw that with martin luther king jr so i just really appreciate this um I don't know if you want to talk about that or the TV shows that that you reference uh, regarding these two different areas of growth for us, personal and collective. Um, how do you balance the two yourself? I'm just going to start with that question. If you want to talk about the TV shows, that'd be great too. Sure. Well, I'm really glad you're bringing this up. So in the great American movement uh, towards... Uh, exploring different faith traditions that happened in the late 60s and early 70s. You know, I just was in Rishikesh where uh, the Beatles went to study with the Maharishi and, um, you know, Cat Stevens became a, a, a Muslim and Steve Jobs lived in a, in a Buddhist commune and, you know, people were exploring different spiritual traditions. That's when a lot of people became Baha'is actually people were very open to alternative spiritual paths. But what quickly happened was uh, because of the patriarchy and so much kind of corruption and uh, uh, in, in organized religion, people turned away from organized religion. And then in the new age, in the new age movement, um, which is mostly white, uh, spirituality just simply became about feeling better inside. And in my mind, uh, there's nothing wrong with feeling better inside. There's nothing wrong with increased serenity, peace, connection, connection to nature, connection to community. It's all, that's all good. However, it, it does feel at times a bit navel gazing and a bit, uh, solipsistic and also a bit consumerist. Um, we Americans like cost benefit analysis, like, oh, every time you, you know, open the internet, it's like, here's an easy life hack to make your life better. If you buy this thing on Amazon, it's going to make your life easier and better. And spirituality kind of became a symptom of this. Hey, meditation will make you function better in your world. So if you cost benefit analysis, you do 15 minutes meditation in the morning, you will be more productive at work, you'll have greater peace, you'll have less anxiety eating away at you. So we used spirituality kind of as a tool um, to calm ourselves in, but we're still hectically pell-mell involved in kind of consumerist materialist culture that's disconnected from nature and from community, but we want these kind of spiritual band-aids. So there's stuff to be questioned there as well. And you're hundred percent right. I mean, the, the entire civil rights movement would not have happened without the support and infrastructure of the black church, Yeah. which how do you think all the organization happened? How do you think people were fed? How do you think communication happened? How do you think transportation happened? It happened because of the black church, because yeah. the black church believed in social change and social movements. And, uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. So what I'm trying to do in Soul Boom is kind of reframe the entire conversation around spirituality, which is no small task, but... Uh, <laughs> and start a new religion. <laughs> and starting a new religion. <laughs> and a new but movement. The, I, and, but, you know, and I do that all tongue in cheek, starting a new religion. Yeah. But the 
the point is, is that, you know, our political system, let's just use that as an example. Systems are corrupt. They're breaking down. They're broken because they're based on the worst aspects of humanity. Systems are based on aggression, one-upsmanship, competition, every man for himself, kind of a toxic individualism. And, um, you know, the political left has tried for decades to build new ways of doing things uh, based on kind of collectivism. But it is missing some key elements, I think, that a spiritual practice can give a, a person. And I, I truly believe that, you know, going back to the American political system, if we were to base the American political system more on spiritual principles, um, it wouldn't be a matter of which party is right and wrong, which candidate is better, because the entire system is completely corrupt. So it doesn't matter if you vote for Bernie Sanders and you think Bernie Sanders is the best, you know, uh, politician out there. Maybe he is. But if you're raising tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars for Bernie Sanders and trying to have him run against someone else and tear that other person down, you're just contributing to a toxic system that's broken. So there are ways to address all of the systems, the education system, the healthcare system, uh, the agriculture system, um, the, the income inequality uh, problems that are going on to address them in spiritual ways. And I try and in a lighthearted way, dig into some of that in Soul Boom. Yeah. I mean, these are all things we need to be thinking about. Um, I wanted to ask you what you thought of Marianne Williamson, because she comes from A Course in Miracles, which is a book. I don't know if you've read it. I've read it a couple of times. I can't say I understand it terribly well, <laughs> but I, I, I resonate with that. There's a truth in Course in Miracles. It's, there's divinity in Course in Miracles. And here she is running for, pre or she did run for president. Um, I mean, are you saying that like it would be good to support someone like Marianne Williamson or like the actual structure of our elections and all that needs to sort of come down first or something else? Well, I think um, I admire Marianne very much and I've enjoyed her work through the years and her early podcasts and stuff she did with Oprah were I found really beneficial to me uh, early on. I, I question her entering the ring of a system that is so essentially kind of corrupt and diseased. Hmm. Um, there's, I don't think there's a way to fix it from within. I don't hmm. think the idea of going to like, quote unquote, debates um, is going to make the world better. I would have in, if she'd asked me and why would she ask a sitcom actor? But if she had asked me, I, I would say, you know, why not build a different kind of movement? Why not build a movement that's outside of the political system and see how that movement can influence the political system? Well, one of the biggest issues with religion in the Western world is God. Let's face it. Most people hate the contemporary idea of God. So I have a chapter in the book called The Notorious G.O.D., where I attempt to redefine God for the modern world. Because as soon as you think about God, you think about a judgmental white man with a beard. And we all know that that's not really God. We know that, right? But I mean, only an idiot really thinks there's a white man with a beard on a cloud scowling down on us. But that energy has suffused, you know, Western religion for for such a long time that people really uh, vehemently turn away from that belief system. And my feeling is that I say to people, well, I don't believe in the God that you don't believe in. Part of my path when exploring God, because I really wanted to do a deep dive, I, I thought as a young man, this is the most important question there is. There's literally no more important question. Either we're a random assemblage of molecules that somehow got consciousness and that's it. And when we die, that's the end. Or there's some kind of power greater than us that moves us 
and this universe and infinite other universes in ways we can't possibly understand beyond kind of time and space and rationality. Those are the two choices. So what I find is most people don't really dig into that question. They kind of are like, oh, I have a hard time with God. And they stop there mm. and they don't dig deeper. So I dug deeper. I read the Buddhist writings, the Sikh writings, Hindu writings, Vedas, Upanishads. Um, and part of it is I was reading in Native American spirituality. And that's when a real big aha moment, as Oprah would say, happened with me, where the Lakota Sioux idea of God as Wakantanka, which literally translates to the great mystery, resonated for me. An idea of a God that is beyond time and space, that is contained in nature, that it doesn't have any kind of personification whatsoever, uh, is just um, a natural force uh, in the universe that's connected to beauty uh, and our ancestors, time, the wind, the tide, the sun, the movement of the seasons, and this mysterious kind of almost artistic essence uh, in nature. I responded to far more, and that opened a portal for me to be able to find uh, God. You talk about here um, in Soul Boom that this kind of God, Wakantanka, walk cannot truly be understood as anything separate from the natural world. In this sense, the Native American, and I, you're quoting here Ro Rosalind Marie Amenetta, Amenta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, in this sense, the Native American does not transcend the world in the Christian or Ved Vedantic or Neoplatonic manner. Rather, he plunges into the world and experiences himself and the earth with all its myriad phenomena as being totally immersed in and revelatory of the divine reality. My first very important spiritual teacher, a man named Sidney Banks, talked about forget that there's two worlds, the spiritual world and the physical world. There's one world. And so that mm. sort of takes away, like, I'm trying to get over there. I'm trying to get to heaven. I'm trying to avoid this place called hell. I mean, it sort of brings you right into this moment, this reality. Now, mm. did you, to me, any, like, where are you going to go? If God is not anywhere else, where are you going to go? Uh, and I wonder what, have you, I know you talk about going to the Baha'i, uh, I think it's temple or the holy place, the most holy place in Israel near Haifa. And do you feel like you experience this from time to time? Because you talk about an experience there of just feeling, do you personally experience these feelings? Oh yeah, I do all the time. I think awesome. what, you're <laughs> what you're talking about is transcendence and do you need to go to a special holy place to find it? No, you don't. Are there special holy places that are kind of supercharged? Yes. That can also be the Grand Canyon. It doesn't have to be a temple. Um, you know, as Thich Nhat Hanh says, you know, the only way out is in. And uh, we find God inside of us just as much as outside of us. Um, that divine transcendent impulse. So... But again, for me, you can believe whatever you want, but if you're not putting it into action and trying to make the world a better place and relieve the suffering of others, then it doesn't do any good. So Soul Boom is about trying to start a movement. That's what we're trying to do on the podcast, Soul Boom, and you know, doing in this upcoming book reading there in Santa Cruz and allow people to tap into spiritual ideas so that it informs their actions and that they are working at making the world uh, a better and better place. Well, I really appreciate all of that, Rain Wilson. Thank you so much for being on this show with me and giving your time to KSQD. Thanks, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, thanks, it. thanks, Mr. Wilson. 